Hello, my name is Greg Kish, and I'm an attorney who practices probate and estate planning law in the Grand Traverse and Leelanau County areas. In this segment, I'll be talking about four common issues faced by most conservators and giving you some ideas about how to handle them. The first issue we'll talk about is the protected individual's estate plan. Now, everyone has an estate plan of some kind. Some individuals may have an estate plan that's more formal. Uh, they may have signed a will or a trust or designated beneficiaries on accounts. For others, it may be less formal. Some people have savings bonds where they've titled them jointly with particular family members or bank accounts that have been titled jointly so that they can pass to the surviving joint owner upon death. Still others have chosen not to put in place any designations at all and instead have left their estate plan to the default plan under Michigan law, which is called intestacy, uh, where the estate passes to the closest family members according to the intestate statute. In any event, a conservator has an important role to play when it comes to the protected individual's estate plan. And that, put simply, is to preserve the protected individual's estate plan as much as possible. Now, when I say preserve, I don't mean preserve the protected individual's estate as much as possible for his or her intended beneficiaries. I mean that the conservator is not supposed to change the distribution pattern in the estate from what the protected individual wanted and had set up to begin with. In understanding a conservator's role in this regard, it's important to understand that a conservator has the legal right to find out information about the protected individual's estate plan. Not only the right, but the duty to do so. This includes accessing the individual's will and getting information from the banks and financial institutions about transfer on death and beneficiary designations that may be in place. The conservator is required to take this estate plan into account when deciding from which account or accounts to spend money to pay bills um, and how to set up any new accounts that need to be set up. This can be very complicated. To give you an example, let's consider a protected individual who has three bank accounts, each with $75,000 in it. Um, and the protected individual has three children and has designated one account to go to each child using a pay-on-death designation at his or her bank. If the conservator has a $50,000 bill to pay, for example, and chooses to pay that bill only out of account number one, the conservator has fairly dramatically changed the protected individual's estate plan. So uh, the important things to remember as the conservator is that uh, your primary obligation is really, of course, to provide for the immediate needs of the protected individual. But in doing so, you also have an obligation to learn about the protected individual's estate plan to the extent there is a plan in place and to try to keep the status quo when it comes to the protected individual's wishes. The second issue that we'll talk about in this segment um, has to do with when to hire professionals or other services on behalf of the conservator. I find that many conservators are really trying to help out the protected individual with the best of intentions, and they want to keep the expenses of the conservatorship low and try to do as much as possible uh, uh, on their own. Um, unfortunately, what can sometimes happen is the conservator can become involved in providing services that he or she really is not equipped or trained to provide. Remember, a conservator has a fiduciary duty to act reasonably. And so when it comes to specialized services, anything from tax preparation to uh, perhaps electrical work on the protected individual's house, or legal services, it's important that the conservator recognize the limits of his or her own expertise and consult 
with experts as needed. The fees for those experts can be paid from the conservatorship estate. The best example I can think of is that if the protected individual has an investment account, understanding the investments in the account, the risk, uh, uh, investment risk that's associated with that account and whether it's appropriate for that protected individual is really outside the scope of expertise for most conservators. I think most conservators would be well served to consult with a financial advisor who can then learn about the protected individual's age, expenses, needs, and estate, and give good expert advice on how to invest those funds. Other examples where a conservator may choose to hire uh, experts or professionals to provide certain services to the protected individual include consulting with a real estate agent or real estate appraiser in conjunction with the sale of a home, hiring an accountant to make sure that tax filings are up to date and done properly, um, hiring a, an appraiser to uh, help understand the value of a vehicle or artwork or other specialized assets before those assets are sold, consulting with an attorney to decipher a protected individual's estate plan if it's not readily apparent, um, better understand your role as conservator or respond to concerns from complaining family members, hiring a home inspector and a real estate management company to help winterize a home or otherwise um, evaluate it and secure it. Trying to do everything yourself as the conservator, particularly if you don't have the training or expertise in that particular area, is a mistake. To the extent that you do act outside of the scope of your expertise and cause harm to the protected individual's estate, um, you could be held personally liable. The third issue that I'll discuss today is dealing with creditors. Sometimes when a conservator takes over, he or she has to deal with competing claims from creditors to the estate's assets. Uh, sometimes the conservator was appointed because in the past the protected individual had been racking up debt or spending more money than the person had. So it's important to understand the legal responsibility that a conservator has when it comes to how to pay those claims and whether to pay those creditor claims. A conservator has a pretty clear priority order for the estate laid out in the conservatorship law. First priority goes to the expenses of administering the conservatorship. This may include court fees and costs, compensation of the conservator, and, and uh, attorney fees for any work that the attorney did in helping with the conservatorship estate, getting it set up, or advising the conservator. The second priority um, are amounts that are owed to the state or federal government. Usually these are taxes, but they could be other kinds of debts that have priority under state or federal law. The next priority are expenses for the care, maintenance, and education of the protected individual. So these kinds of expenses, uh, assisted living expenses, medical bills, prescription drug costs, these are a higher priority than other creditors like credit card bills or other debts which may be out there. Finally, claims that arose before the conservatorship was established and any other claims can be paid if the resources are sufficient and the conservator determines that the claims are valid. So if you find yourself as a conservator with a limited estate and many competing claims, remember priority goes to administering the conservatorship, state and federal claims, and then the care and maintenance of the protected individual. The last issue that we'll talk about is a good reminder for conservators that just because you've received your letters of authority 
doesn't mean that you never have to go back to the probate court for assistance or that you don't want to go back to the probate court for assistance. When to seek court involvement or the help of an attorney is important, important to, to know. There are a few common situations where this, where I see this happen on a fairly regular basis. The first and most obvious one is um, anything that is beyond the scope of your authority, as noted in your the court order and letters of authority, um, requires probate court approval. So if the letters of conservatorship say that the conservator must get court approval before spending more than a certain amount of money, and you would like to spend uh, an amount greater than that limit, you need to file a petition with the probate court and ask the court for permission, giving the court information about the transaction and why you think it's in the best interest of the protected individual. By law, a conservator is required before selling any real estate at all or before selling the person, the protected individual's principal dwelling uh, to get probate court approval in advance. And finally, in the event that there's a particularly contentious situation uh, involving family members or joint owners of accounts with the protected individual who are disputing uh, whether what the conservator has done is appropriate, Oftentimes, um, if the, the dispute cannot be worked out or discussed, um, it's a good idea to go to the probate court um, and ask for approval of what the conservator has done or is uh, planning to do in the future. This provides an opportunity for the court to schedule a hearing, to notify all of the interested persons of what's going on, um, and to have them have the opportunity to uh, bring evidence to the court so that the court can make a good decision about what's best for the protected individual. This protects the conservator in the long run uh, against complaints that may come up later from family members that what the conservator did was not appropriate. A conservator should always feel uh, safe and secure if the conservator is following uh, the order of the court. That wraps up this segment uh, discussing four common issues that conservators face. Thank you.